Um, which one is it, left or right for the controller? Anyhow, we will see. So first of all, thanks for inviting. However, I'm actually quite nervous. I mean, being more on the academic side and then seeing the people that help or actually do the real work of making many of my dreams happen is amazing, and, but it makes me also a little bit more uh, yeah, nervous. And actually, look, I mean, talking about fair ML and then coming with a more academic issue, that's unfair. So, and so because I was somehow expecting something like that, I asked one of my friends, who is definitely interested in fair ML, to set the stage for the talk, okay? And before we listen to him, let's first see a slightly different title that is hopefully making it more attractive to what I want to tell you. And it's actually this question of, is there something like an 01, 02, 03 flag for machine learning, for statistical machine learning? So we heard a lot about we should have interpretable models. We have heard about, hey, I want to be fast. I want to deal with a lot of data. But then actually looking at what is going on in machine learning, there's not much work on how can we have compilers for machine learning, right? I mean, you see here a little bit of language and there a little bit of language, but not many people move much more closer to the architecture and try to get something like a high-level programming language and compiler for machine learning. Anyhow, as promised, so here's my friend. I'm very happy that he managed to give us a short intro to the topic. Okay, can someone make the volume on? But as all of you know, understand let me. Let me go back because there's a cool, if you haven't listened to that one, if you haven't seen it, there's a cool joke in the beginning. Hi, everybody. Normally, I'd begin these remarks with a joke about data science, but about half the stuff my staff came up with was below average. But as all of you know, understanding and innovating with data has the potential to change the way we do almost anything for the better. That's why my administration's opened up massive amounts of government data to the public for the first time, with more than 135,000 data sets available for download at data.gov. Think about the weather and map apps we check every day on our phones, many of which are powered by open government data along with countless other apps and services. Or our new Precision Medicine Initiative, which joins data science and healthcare to accelerate treatments for disease. We want more Americans to dream up and deploy innovations like these, to solve problems, save lives, and create new jobs and opportunities. That's why I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. DJ Patel as the federal government's first chief data scientist. And that's why I'm asking you to help. As DJ likes to say, data science is a team sport. That's why we want you, America's data scientists, to join us in this effort. Help us build better digital services for the American people. Help us unleash new innovation in areas like healthcare and climate change. Help us change this country and this world for the better. Thanks. So I think he's completely right. Um, it's only that it should really not only be the U.S., right? In particular, Europe, and in particular, many other regions in the world. Uh, I'm, I typically talk about Europe because we have the only alternative or similar thing we have there is Gutenberg, and he's famous for um, yeah, faking his PhD thesis. So this is kind of weird. Anyhow, so I really, really think we need much more about how to communicate about data science. We need much more about understanding all the different disciplines and make Joe Public um, aware of that. Anyhow, I, I think this is all showing this, de this, this arms race for deeply understanding data, right? This is an old story in a sense already. And it's typically told like, yeah, take your spreadsheet, apply some machine learning, whatever you like. It's so easy, right? This is what you know even better than me. Um, and that's it. So the question is, is it really that simple? And, and we have already heard some of the stories when it comes to being fair, or maybe even on purpose unfair. But there are much fundamental, more fundamental issues here. And I would like to go through one of these examples together with you. It's a very simple example. So imagine we have this deck of cards, 
And I'm asking you, okay, I'm shuffling it maybe several times. I turn around the first card. And I'm asking you, what is the probability that it's an ace? It's easy, right? So there are four aces, there are 52 cards, so you can divide the number, you get the answer. I can also ask you the question, what is the probability that, I'm shuffling again, that if I only turn around the second card, what is the probability that it's an ace or a queen? You know, you just think again, oh yeah, with the same answer, right? So you get this answer. So let's see whether current AI and machine learning technology can solve that. And I think actually is almost independently whether it's deep learning or not. Um, so let's see. So we use here a graphical model, so we represent that using probabilities, right? And so you have all these different random variables here, where the first here tells you the position, and the second one is telling you the, the value. So now, um, a graphical model is not just random variables, but you depict also independencies in there by placing um, arcs, edges in between there. So essentially, you're coding something like the dependency, but actually it's the independency you're interested in. How does that look like here? Well, let's have a look at the very first random variable here. The value very much depends on all other random variables, right? If you think about it, I mean, if the first one is not the particular value of D2, then some of the others have to be D2, and so on, and so on. So if you go on, actually the whole graphical model looks roughly like that. Everything is connected. So if you look then closer at that, then that actually means there's no independency at all. It's fully connected, or you have to represent something like 2 to the power of, what is it, 2,704 states. And we had in one of the talks today already um, this reference to how many atoms are there in the universe, I think this is much more than even that number, right? So it's really not solvable. Isn't that weird? I mean, we are talking about whether AI is taking over the world, and then this very innocent problem can't be solved by the machine. So what are we missing here? Yeah. Any idea? heuristics, representations. Well, we are smart enough to see that positions and cards and values are interchangeable in a sense, right? There's a lot of redundancy or symmetries in here. But the machine is so dumb to not make use of it. So what is currently happening is this new idea of not just using a dumb language, but using a high-level language, in this case logic, but it doesn't depend much on logic, and it's a weighted logic, together with symmetry-aware or language-aware inference. And if you use some of the existing systems, and if you want to know more about that, you can also talk to Avi later, and he gives a talk about a related problem there, um, then you can solve the whole issue in milliseconds, even exactly. So, main point here is, if we really manage to go ahead and not just stay with a simple spreadsheet, a sheet and just simple languages, but we go for high-level languages. Then we can employ these high-level languages to make inference and learning faster, not only modeling. Okay? So here's an example just to illustrate that. It's a big Bayesian network. It's a rather simple one. It's about smoking in France. I'm a smoker. I'm one of these horrible European guys. And so you're interested how long um, I will survive. And then because of all these infra symmetries in there, actually you can automatically compile that to this very simple smaller model. And you can imagine that running any kind of probabilistic inference um, approach on the smaller model is much more efficient, right? So, this is not a new story. It's going on for at least 10, 15 years already. It's called statistical relational AI or statistical relational learning. It tries to combine more expressive languages together with graphical models or probabilities. And if you're interested in some more details, uh, we just published a book on that and also AFI, a similar book on more probabilistic programming perspective. So there is some interesting sources to understand how this all works. Okay? But so far I was cheating in a sense. Right? We were interested in applying machine learning, in particular statistical machine learning, and graphical models are cool, but they are not just, I mean, statistical machine learning is much more. Actually, we heard graphical models, I think, for the first time in this talk, at least here at this venue. So there's so much more. 
how do we do it there? Right, so let's have an example. So we would like to do a very simple task. We would like to classify publication scientific papers into, let's say, whether they are about machine learning or not, right? So how do we do that? Well, one typical machine learning approach is to use a support vector machine for that, right? So who has used support vector machines already? Yeah, cool. But I guess most of you have never really touched the QP formulation of it, the quadratic program formulation of it, but you just call the standard solver. And I think this is good, because if you want to use the QP formulation, you really have to love linear algebra. And many of my students, they hate linear algebra. They really don't want to touch this, and it's actually not easy, right? You have to map what you have in mind, publications and blah, 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 into a row or a column of a matrix. It really takes a lot of effort. So instead of going directly to the matrix, uh, we were working now on something like a relational language, very similar actually to logic blocks, that helps you to avoid these um, solver form, but stays with the paper form in a sense, right? So it looks roughly, um, roughly like that. That's more the paper form. You will see later on the Python paper form, so to say. But you can write down something like inline definitions. Well, for those who knows um, support vector machines, you need to talk about slacks if you don't want to talk about linear separate, uh, separably uh, problems only. You have your objective, and you have constraints on your objective. Please note, in contrast to all existing languages, you really can have high-level concepts in here, like all the features. You just talk about, you sum over all the features in there without even talking about the features per se. Okay, this is quite interesting, because actually this helps you to digest or um, extract the very core of what's going on here. So if you use this SVM on a different data set, you don't have to change the few li lines you have just seen. They stay the same, and only your data is changing. Right? So uh, instead of working independently as done so far all the time, so I'm changing a little bit the quadratic program, and then I'm the big king, and I'm not giving you that because I want to have the next paper. No, what we can now easily do is I change the intentional part of the program I share it, and then everyone can use it and improve a lot, right? So instead of being somehow separate, we can now work on the essence of the problem and share that, and everyone is just changing their data. So I was again cheating. Seems like Germans like to cheat. <laughs> uh, not sure. So, but anyhow, publications are citing each other, right? So how can we make use of this? So typically, you would have to use something like a graph kernel. And if you don't like linear algebra, I can't imagine that you like spectral theory. So it's not getting easier for you, right? This is not the, really the way to go. So question is, do we really need this fancy stuff? So don't get me wrong, I like the fancy stuff. But I also like to keep it simple and only to use it when really needed. So here's an alternative, at least for the kind of problems we are currently looking at. So you have high-dimensional examples like the papers, and in the papers all the words are encoded as a single feature, and then additionally you have this information about citing. So instead of going for a kernel, we are now just adding a few lines of program code. So you're talking about um, whether it's citing or not, so you try to look at the labels of the citing papers. And again, it's just one line, and you're not talking about particular papers here. You just write it down as you like it. And then you add few additional rules down here, simply saying, hey, I want to be on the same side of the hyperplane as my citing papers. That's all what you do. So it's essentially something like three lines of code you're adding there. No kernel. Or coming back to the previous talk, this is still even understandable. Well, maybe not to my mom, but to a person that is trying to do classification, okay? So this is all embedded in Python, because actually I don't believe that everyone loves logic. So if you want to use for loops instead of for all, use it. That's fine with me, right? So you choose what you like the most. Um, actually, you can also interface directly with any database management system you like. So you get scalability in a sense, and also uh, another source of speed. 
And even more interesting, at least for me, being an academic, you can combine that with a probabilistic language, something you, like, uh, you saw before, and get something like stochastic mathematical programs and a general purpose solver for them. Maybe not the most efficient one, but at least we can now start to explore, even without being an expert in that. So, but I was talking about the OFLEX, right? Funny part is because you have this language, you can directly don't look at this formula, so it's just it's a nice figure there. So what you can do is now you can automatically detect symmetries. So you can detect that this is one paper behaves exactly like the other paper in terms of how it influences the other papers and their classification. This is done automatically, it runs in quasi-linear time, so it scales to graphs with millions. I think the largest one we were looking at is 60 million edges, runs on a standard desktop in a second. So even if there's no symmetry, Spending a second doesn't hurt really, right? Because typically solving the whole problem takes much longer. So that's pretty cool. It helps. Um, we can go into details, but that's boring, I guess. But it's really boosts performance. And if you're still not convinced, so we are talking about here the interplay of language and optimization. So what we just finished actually two hours ago, because then there was the NIPS deadline, I guess. Um, <laughs> It is because we have a language, we can look at the parse tree of the formulas. Now, such a parse tree looks very similar to an algebraic decision diagram. So instead of doing everything via the standard technology of linear algebra, we are now replacing sparse matrices by algebraic decision diagrams. And this mapping is super fast, but then we have a problem. If we do optimization, we can't do what is called Cholesky factorization easily with decision diagrams. But that's not a problem anymore because you can use so-called matrix-free optimization. So and if you do that, you get actually out of the box a system that can easily deal with 60 million non-zeros. So we are not talking about the overall problem size, but just the non-zeros in your problem. Um, 12 minutes per iteration on a standard desktop. And actually, right now, it's also running on the 1 billion. And I think it's just a little bit of reprogramming to get it to arbitrary size using some database technology in there. So f with that, I just want to look a little bit ahead, so to say, in this talk, what I think data science will look like in the future. We will have these high-level languages that help us to develop even the next level of fair, of course, machine learning approaches. And all this is, in a sense, my, my hobby here is that it's all about democratization, not of data, but of optimization, because it should not be just the few people that really love linear algebra or even higher order mathematics. It should be all of us that can do this cool stuff and hopefully much faster. And because we have this high level language, you really can much easier build fancy optimization approaches. You can um, make use of sophisticated domain knowledge to build your models, um, and you can even speed up solvers. I mean, we were using here uh, industry strength solvers, so like Roby on CPLEX, and we can all speed them up. And I'm not Stephen Boyd, not yet at least, so this is pretty, pretty amazing. If you're still not convinced, actually this is all going back to an old grand challenge of Jim Gray, one of our Turing Award um, winners, and he was posing this challenge of automated programming. And for me, data science is maybe the best environment to prove that this guy was not wrong, that we can really realize something like automated programming with very useful changing the world, helping the world to survive, in a sense, applications. And that can't be done just by the machine learner, it can't be done just by me, it can't be done by a single discipline, but this is really where we can get come all together and show that together we can really make it. Thanks.